But really, uh, what this talk um, is going to be about is going to be uh, what, I, what I hope it's going to be. It's like an overview of you know stability problems for black holes that have been uh, you know interesting. Uh, lots of uh, mathematicians, so very, most, mostly mathematical GI in the past uh, few decades or so, few decades or so. And uh, the main protagonist of all these uh, stability problems really is the Kerr black hole, or more specifically the Kerr family. Now, I, I, I bet most of you are familiar with, which is a two-parameter family of solutions to the Einstein vacuum equation, so there is an explicit. Um, Beautiful explicit solution for to the Kerr family, and this is the representation of the Penrose diagram that uh, we all know represents a stationary and rotating black hole of mass m, so that's one of the parameters, and the other parameter a is related to the angular momentum, so this this black hole is rotating uh, around its axis, and for a equals zero it reduces to Schwarzschild, and it may be um, sort of more. Um, uh, sort of the first black hole that one encounters, but really the Kerr family is the main one uh, because it's believed to be the unique stationary asymptotically flat solution to the Einstein vacuum equation. So this is something that's also known as the Nohier theorem. So that really says that in a certain sense, all black holes which are stationary, so they don't have any dynamics anymore left to them, uh, are, uh, are given by uh, a member of the Kerr family. And so they, this, this, these are also expected to be the final state of gravitational collapse if they are stable, right? So uh, really, um, this family is the is the family that is used in all in all really, for example, the vector gravitational waves or uh, uh, sort of astrophysical um, uh, understanding of our, our black holes. When we have, when we need to have sort of a mathematical explicit solution. That's what that's the, the what the Kerr family is. Uh, is used for. Um, and of course, you know, all this understanding uh, of its crucial um, uh, position is uh, there is also, also an underlying uh, uh, hope or as a sense, conjecture that they are stable. So that if there are perturbations that happen to them, such as, you know, can be big perturbations, such as two black holes that merge, that are like each other merge, we have one black hole. Or small perturbations, some radiation falls into it, or you know any any sort of perturbation, we expect that this perturbation would not change the the overall behavior of the Kerr family, and that's uh, that's sort of the main conjecture. We now have uh, a theorem, again, a, sort of a rigorous mathematical theorem that comes as a has a combination of results by Karma Sheftel, Karma Sheftel and myself and Shen. That shows the very slow rotating Kerr family. So when A is much slower, the much slower than, than M is stable. And here we're saying we're, we're talking about the stability solutions to the fully nonlinear and vacuum equation. Now I'm gonna come back uh, soon on the meaning of all these words, um, but really this is what is, I'm gonna get to the, the end of the talk. I mean this is sort of a little bit of an overview of this theorem, but what I I what I want to do is really to get there, to sort of trying to you know, explain what were all the steps, how did we get to 2022 to prove such a theorem, and how many uh, you know, things were done earlier you know, by the physics community and the mathematics community. So uh, this is a sort of um, is a natural um, sort of the natural beginning of this story is really in the black hole perturbation theory. Um, area, which is sort of the uh, sort of the golden area of general relativity, uh, is called. This is what we're talking about the 60s and 70s, um, and that's um, that's what people were mostly doing analysis of perturbations of non black hole solutions to to the Einstein equation. So here there are lots of these uh, these results from back then that are contained in this book, a beautiful book by Shantra Seta, the, the mathematical theory of black holes. So here is a snapshot of uh, some of its uh, some of its index. And you see there are chapters on perturbation of Schwarzschild. Rice and Nordstrom is the you know, charged version of Schwarzschild, then uh, the chapter on K, and then there's also the chapter of Kerr Newman, which is the charged version of the Kerr black hole. So what what uh, what is a black hole perturbation theory and why 
why, and even even before that, even before we get to what does it mean to perturb a black hole, why can we even perturb a black hole? Well, we can do that because of the theorem by Schottebohr. So that, and uh, that's no, that was a mathematician theorem that in the 50s proved that the Einstein equation uh, in a particular set of coordinates with coordinates is in a linear hyperbolic system of PDEs. And as such, has what is called the Cauchy stability, so as local word poseness and continuously best solution that. So in particular, given an, as, as an initial value for relation, so given uh, an initial time for, for an appropriate notion of time, um, and if you're given an initial data for the Einstein equation, which you know it's it's a metric and a set of fundamental form on a, on a three-dimensional um, space like a surface and three-dimensional manifold, by a manifold, then you can construct these these two have to satisfy all the constraint equations, then there exists a solution, a unique solution that is maximal to the Einstein equation given this initial data. So we, there is an initial value formulation, and um, so we can at least you know solve uh, for some initial data and solve locally for the Einstein equation. Now, what the black hole perturbation theory is is not really simply the application of this theorem, but it actually concerns the long time behavior of this solution. So the theorem of Schrodinger tells us what happens locally in time, right? So that the fact that if you have some initial data, some initial data, you can solve locally in time for the solutions to the Einstein equation. Now the question is, well, okay, that's what happens locally in time after a short period of time, and then what happens after a long period of time? What is the what, what is going to happen to the solution? That's what the black hole perturbation theory wants to understand. It's the long time behavior of the solutions. And historically, this kind of problems have been done to, in two different ways. One, through domestic perturbations, which in a certain sense is the most direct way you can, uh, uh, you can do this kind of problem, which really means you take your metric, uh, you take your care metric, and you consider to have, you, you, you perturb it, so you add a small change to it, so this g dot, and then you study the behavior of this, of this new, um, new metric that is also a solution on the extent vacuum equation. So that's uh, very direct. Um, and, and another, method, another way is a bit less direct, but it has in fact turned out to be necessary, um, is, what I call, is what is called the curvature perturbations, or to the neumann perros formalism, if anyone is familiar with that. And that consists of not simply so you're not simply considering perturbing the metric, you know that associated to your metric there are going to be Christoffel symbols and curvature components, and so you really think of perturbations of that too. So you think that well, your, your Christoffel symbols will be the ones of your background plus some perturbation, and the same happens for the curvature. And um, once you do that, then you want to use what are called the Ricci and Bianchi identities, which are the relations between curvatures of Christoffel symbols and, uh, and uh, sorry, derivatives of Christoffel symbols and curvatures. And you, by linearizing, linearizing these, these identities, you, you get some uh, equations for these Christoffel symbols and curvature you want to solve. Now the problem is that this, these equations are in an entangled system uh, for metric and you know, Christoffel symbols and curvature component, with in addition to that is an infinite dimensional kernel. And the reason why uh, there is this infinite dimensional kernel is because the Einstein equation, uh, which uh, in, uh, or maybe I wrote in the first, in the first slide, uh, is reaching curvature equal to zero, is an equation for a tensor. Right? So we all learn when we introduce tensor, either in a math class to sort of section of vector bundles, or in a physics class in a more sort of maybe pragmatic uh, definition of that. But really, really the, the definition of the tensor <coughs> means uh, that the, this object is invariant under change of coordinates. That's how we define tensors in the first place. So that's, uh, that's why they're useful, because of an invariant of coordinates, but that's also why they're difficult to deal with, because then every time you have a metric that satisfies an Einstein equation and you change the coordinates, well, that change of coordinate doesn't change the, the Einstein equation, so that's still a solution to the Einstein equation. So you have an infinite, not an infinite degree of freedom. So that's something that, that's, that's a huge uh, difficulty in dealing with this kind of system. So, if any, if any of you is familiar with Newman Perros formula, is here, I'm really talking about all those, I think there are something like 20 or so Greek letters that are used to describe all these geometrical quantities, and there are like sort of four or more equations um, 
that uh, involve them, that they're really that they're this system, this uh, type of system that I'm talking about here. Okay, so let's uh, let's back again using the book of Ajahn Fonseca. Let's try to remind ourselves what was done I mean, in the literature in the black group perturbation theory. How did these perturbations, uh, were these perturbations studied? And as you can see, for example, if we look at the chapter perturbation of Schwarzschild in, in this book, we see that there is a subsection on the metric perturbation, a subsection on perturbation of the lumen perus formula, so this curvature perturbation, and it's something that uh, Shana Zegar calls the transformation theory, which it's a connection between these two kinds of transformation. So, something with the metric perturbations, as I said, something is the sort of the most direct way. What you really do, you try to write your, exam, your metric as some explicit, in you know, some explicit form that perturbs your Schwarzschild metric. So, your Schwarzschild metric can be written in that form, or some of the coefficients will be zero, for example. And then you study what happens to these coefficients that are added in your, in your definition. Um, and, uh, sorry, okay. Um, and now the, um, uh, what happens is that the coupled equation for um, axial perturbations, uh, so that they, if, you're, if you're looking at some specific um, equation for, uh, for this, uh, some, some, some specific components of this um, perturbation, they are described by what is called the Reggie Wheeler equation, which has this form. So this is a down version. So it's it's really it's uh, the, the Schwarzschild version of the of the standard down version of the operator in uh, minus d squared plus Laplace and Minkowski space. So that's the, the, the wave operator equal to some potential. There is you know, it's a very nice and positive potential. And in general, um, with I'm going to call a regular equation, an equation of this form, something that is a box minus a potential, where, we are, where B is a positive real potential. And this equation is very important, it's going to come up uh, soon, but the, the point here is that this is a very good equation. And then there, there is some other equation that's called the Zerilli equation that involves the other part of the, of the, of the metric perturbation, but I'm not going to use it here, so I'm not going to probably recall that. So these are the metric perturbations of Schwarzschild. Now, why? So this is, this is this is a nice equation, and you can study that. But why do we need a curvature perturbation? Why do we want to go to second to the to to the no, to the values of the metric to the curvature? Well, because if, if you try to do perturbations of K, you you cannot get such a nice equation for metric perturbations of K. So you actually to do perturbations of K, one has to go to curvature perturbation. This is something that was realized by Tukowski in, uh, in, in his thesis in the 70s, 1972, where he found that um, uh, there are some scale, some, some bias scalars so or components of the, of the curvature that um, satisfy the coupled equation. So remember that full system of entangled system of, of equations are complicated, many or all related to each other. Well, there is one component, so actually two components, the value uh, scale, so that this capital of psi zero, capital of psi four, uh, or some scaled version of them, that satisfy what is called the Tukowski equation. So the Tukowski equation is written here. So you can see it's a little bit more complicated than the Reggie equation. In fact, you know, in general, uh, I would say the Tukowski equation is something that in addition to a uh, to potential has also a bunch of super terms. As you can see here, it has a, some dr defined t derivatives. And uh, this is um, this is something uh, uh, no, it's okay, it's less nice than the Reggie Miller equation, but it's still very nice because in fact it's separable and uh, this um, this equation can be studied, in fact, as we're gonna see now in seven. And it's actually also something very general. So this so the gravitational perturbations are Described by the Stokowski equation of spin plus and minus two, but uh, uh, electromagnetic perturbations are instead described by the same equation with spin plus and minus one. So it is, it is a very general um, property um, and of perturbations of black holes. So it, is, it was a fundamental breakthrough because the, this is a decoupled equation to study perturbations of care. And so, what when these equations were found, so as I said in the 70s and so on, then Okay, then another question is how do we study them? How do we understand if there is some stability associated to these equations or not? Um, and, and before, uh, 
getting into them, and there is the, uh, re related to that, um, there is this uh, transformation theory that Shantan Sekhar um, talks about, um, that really, uh, as a quote he did from, from his book, uh, it says the problem is to express the solution of an equation of this form, which is uh, the way he's writing the Tobolsky equation, as a solution of one dimensional equation, so a solution of the regular equation. And, and that's, um, and of course, uh, these two uh, approaches, the metric and the curvature perturbations, are not right, independent one of each other, right? They, they are related to the fact that one is a metric one is a curvature. So they, there is a relation between them, and in fact, there is a way of relating this, this two by uh, doing a transformation that we now call the chandra Sekhar transformation, that unsurprisingly sort of involves two derivatives uh, of one equation with respect to another, and that which, is, which reminds, which is sort of reminiscent of the fact that the, the curvature is, is the level of two derivatives of the metric. So there is this transformation theory of you know, hidden and uh, in, this, in this picture. And so how do we study these equations? Well, what people were, were doing you know, back then in the uh, 70s and 80s is what is called the classical mode analysis. And mode analysis consists in separating the, uh, the equations of both the Regimir and the Tukowski equations that can be separated uh, into modes. And a mode, so let's say, now for simplicity, just take the, the box equals zero equation, well, the modes can be are, are equations of this form, equations that can be separated into their dependence in T and their dependence in phi. So T and phi are the two symmetries of our space time, the stationary and axial symmetry. And then in addition to that, there is a hidden symmetry of the Kerr space time, the Kapton tensor, that allows to separate even further um, our, our equation into a dependence in R only and theta only. So it's really a, a full separation of variables. And once you did you do this full separation of variables, you get uh, two of these, one angular lead that defines what are called spiral harmonics, and one radial lead, which is the main lead that you want to study to get what is called, for example, mode stability, which is the statement that there are novel solutions which start with some finite energy and have imaginary part of omega, so this frequency which is greater than zero. Because if that happens, then it means that this exponential will have a positive, uh, so this full, this full um, exponential here will have a positive real uh, growth in T. So we are, we we're talking about something that has a finite energy at time zero and then grows exponentially. That's something that we, we don't want if we, if we, uh, if we believe that uh, this the, the, these perturbations, or these equations uh, represent perturbations of something that is stable. And in fact, most stability holds. So there have been many works that have sort of led to that, but the main and then definitely proof was at the Whiting in, in 1989. And it is a very uh, surprising proof uh, because um, in care, even the standard energy conservation fails for the equation because of super radiance. And this is something, this is very. Uh, famous um, notion that you know, it's related to the dependence process and so on, so to the fact that the vector T, the DDT, is not time like everywhere outside the event horizon, but there is a region close to the horizon, the Hergo region, where DDT is, is space like. And so the way the proof goes, and in Whiting's proof, is that um, uh, the, 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 our solution, the solution to the Tukowski equation, to the to the wave equation is transformed into a new one with uh, some new R tilde S tilde um, that satisfies you know, the wave equation with respect to a new metric for which there is no algorithm. And this transformation is uh, injective so that you can sort of then, if you, if you know that there is no uh, growing, no growing of the energy in the second one, you can deduce that there is no growth of the energy in the first one. So um, that's uh, that's you know that's very uh, very important uh, proof and uh, it is really you know it's a it's a sort of um, it, it is a statement of you know black holes are it's a, it's a statement that sort of goes into the direction of black holes are stable right but it's not the full story so I'm gonna try to 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 explain now and, and just before we go there I'm just gonna um, mention very briefly that these results. Well, the Schwarzschild is not in Kerr, but not in Kerr new one. And we're going to come back, you know, briefly 
to, to why is that the case? Why is the charge rotating black hole different in, the, in, this, in this aspect? Right, so now, what about going beyond modes? So what, uh, why should we go beyond modes and what does it mean? Well, if we uh, remind ourselves of what is the Einstein equation, well, it's uh, g equal to zero. zero. If we write it as, uh, for example, as Schuchel-Bolov's theorem in, with respect as an equation for the metric, this is really a non-linear equation, okay? So, in, in general, what, what this, what, uh, you know, stability of this equation will really mean is that I start with a, with a, with an initial, with, with some, um, with a solution with some initial data, and I want to prove that now, uh, under some small perturbations, the new the evolution of the new perturbed initial data will converge asymptotically in time to some member of the same family, okay? And this, um, so if I let the evolve to the full nonlinear Einstein equation, as it should, right? As again, the equation is a nonlinear operator. So now, one, just to put things into perspective, one can say, okay, this is a, sounds like a difficult problem, let's simplify it a little bit, when as a first simplification, you can consider the linearized equation, which in a certain sense, you, you want to linearize your ratio operator, Evaluate it at your specific solution and then show that all these solutions, for example, are dedicated time. Or even simpler than that, even sort of more basic, you want to show more stability, which is really a, a, a sub case of the linearized problem because you are only looking at separated solutions and you're only showing that those separated solutions do not exponentially go in time. So this does not, for example, mean that all solutions decay in time. And so this is, as a, you can even linearize uh, and do this approximation, or you can actually consider your full linear stability. And now, let me try to motivate why do we need to, uh, to do the linear stability if we have no stability already. Well, because no stability is still consistent with the statement that general perturbations, which are finite initial energy, will grow with time. Okay? And that's because when you have the most stability result, that's telling you that there are no you know, those, those frequencies for which you have exponential growing uh, solutions do not uh, are not there. But um, the, this um, uh, this this statements so or systems of these individual modes. Uh, are not obtained uniform in the frequency, uniform in the frequency. So in particular, if you try to sum up all these infinite frequencies, uh, so if you try to uh, get a statement for uh, a general solution, uh, you just cannot deduce it from a possibility result. Because again, so if you have statements at level of individual modes, which do not imply statements for the superposition of the infinite sum, so superposition infinitely many modes. For example, if you look at the wave equation on the torus, well, this has, uh, you know, it has a most stability result, so it does not emit any exponential grain modes, but there are solutions that grow in time. This is just to, 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 to give an example of why most stability is weaker than, uh, than the linear stability. And why do we need the non-linear stability? Right? So let's say we can look at, look at the linear equation, why do we need to do the non-linear? Well, because the non-linear part can, uh, can ruin it completely. Um, in fact, if you if you have the, if you, you can consider the nonlinear equation box of psi equal to psi square, then its, linear, its linearization is just box of equal to zero, and then it's you know, stable solution. The same Minkowski and Pokemon Minkowski case was solutions, you know, in complex exponential data bound in the beginning time, right? It's a better solution, you know, everything about those equations. But Solutions of, of these equations is that with this nonlinearities, with this nonlinearity, this is like square, those solutions which are arbitrary small initial data, they actually blow up in finite time. This is a work by John in the 80s that, uh, as you see, as the, 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 the physicists who were working on this part of mathematicians started you know, catching up on uh, what, what would they, all this mean really from a mathematical point of view, how do we study these kind of problems? And uh, in the 80s, we mostly, we were mostly working on understanding the equation in Minkowski space and how the nonlinearities would, 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 would work. And also here, you can see from this example that uh, the nonlinear non part of the Einstein equation can really 
so everything that you've done in the linear theory, not even talking about the most complicated result, into as has been totally useless because the full real real, real uh, equation could be unstable because of some of, of the presence of this non-linear terms. So that's why we to, to understand the answer equation we really, we really need both the linear and, and the fully non-linear um, stability. Okay, so but then uh, if I hopefully convince you of, of that, that we have to start the full uh, uh, Einstein equation, then uh, how how do we do that? Uh, because uh, you know, if you if you do if you study modes, then uh, okay, you have all these, right? So you see the composing and modes, you have the straight on the you study all these. Now, how do we study instead PDs and uh, actual PDs? So general solutions of this of these equations. Well, the way we study is to obtain what are called a priori energy estimates. So these are statements such as you know energy boundedness. So we say that energy at time t is bounded by some universal constant and times the energy at time zero. Well, what is the energy? Well, it's some. Uh, some positive expression in the first derivative on of our solution. And there's also something that are called Morales estimates, something even, even stronger than, than the energy boundedness. Well what it's bound by initial energy is not simply the energy at t, but it's even a space-time energy, so an energy that is um, evaluated in the full in a full slab, in a, in a full space-time region, not just on a high surface. So that's stronger because if this energy is bound at time zero, and this also has an integration in time, it sorts of implies some decay in time for your solution. So how do we obtain this kind of energy estimates? Well, they are, uh, they should, I mean, this should remind um, yourself about, for example, conservation of the energy in Minkowski space. And uh, how do we get conservation of the energy for solutions to the, to the uh, wave equation? Well, what we do, we take our equation, we multiply by dt uh, psi, and we integrate by parts. So we write our equation, integrating by parts, we get that the dt of this positive sum uh, plus some boundary terms is equal to zero. So that if you integrate over over your space, your, your space then you get that the integral of this uh, of this quantity over over the space is conserved, and that's the energy. And so that's the conservation of the energy for the wave equation. So inspired by that, so that's for the standard uh, wave equation in Minkowski space. Inspired by that, one can generalize this kind of argument, and that's basically you know, what was done in the in the actual vector field method uh, that was mostly uh, the result of the final. So what is the, the vector field method? Uh, well, how does the vector field method work? Well, um, in the way the way it works uh, is, is really to um, I mean, the, the equivalent way of multiplying your equation by some dt psi integrating by parts is by taking the energy momentum tensor associated to the wave equation and uh, and computing its divergence. Its divergence is given precisely by using box times your dv, so that's exactly this kind of, we're recreating this kind of picture. And now, um, if box is equal to zero, then this is equal to zero, so we, are, we have, we have obtained something that has divergence equal to zero, we want to apply the divergence theta. Okay? So now this is still, um, so this is still a sort of um, a one form, so to, to actually really recreate this, you want to contract your energy momentum tensor with the vector field. So that now the divergence is going to be precisely your, your vector field. So you can think of x as being dt psi times the, the box. Now, if x is a general vector field, you're also going to have the V derivative of the metric with respect to this vector field. So now, if if your vector field is killing, so it's a symmetry, so just like with dt, then this divergence will be equal to zero, and you can do integration. If you get, if you do integration of parts, you really get conservation of the energy. So, um, and this is this is the goal. This is what you want to mimic. You want to try to use this this method, this vector field method, with vector fields that give you some positive definite boundary terms. So boundary terms for from the divergence theorem, right? So the divergence theorem tells us that the divergence k okay, is equal to the you know, the difference of the boundary terms. And you you want to compare vector fields for which uh, the boundary terms are positive definite, such as x equal to dt. And 
to get those more out of SPS, so space-time energy, you want to have vector field that has this divergence, which is possible to definitely start. And those are going to be set modification of DDR. So this again was introduced by more outlets. And so this is what you want in your code. But now in care, you have to come to the fact that you have traditional difficulties. Um, first of all, there are chop nudge desics, even in Schwarzschild. And these chop nudge desics are uh, sort of, uh, or known as you know, the photosphere, they call it uh, the photosphere. So these are nudge desics that concentrate on a finite region of space, and so they are uh, an obstruction to decay. And in fact, what, what can be shown is that this, the, this uh, space time energy has to degenerate at this drop, not to the SFC. And the other problem is the we have already mentioned, super radiance. So the vector field DDT is not found like everywhere, but it has this, this huge of this region where it's space like. So the, this boundary term P, this boundary term being positive definite is not that simple to get. But nevertheless, it, it can be done. Right? Nevertheless, solutions of motivations are stable in the full spectrum range. So for general solutions of, of, the, of the wave equation in the full range A less than M, satisfying of stability, stable stability properties such as such as you know, if they have some bounded initial energy, they will have some bounded energy and even satisfying it from point to one spot. So they decay. And this is was a proof uh, a theorem by the Rosenstein to Rockman, relatively recent, right, about you know, uh, ten years ago. And um, this this proof, you know, is it's very uh, it's a kind of complicated um, proof. Um, in the case of Schwarzschild, you can it can be simplified because the super, there is no super radiance and the trapping is, is simply a particle of 3M at the photosphere. Now in care, the trap nonetheless is are not confined on one hypersurface at particle 3M, but they actually um, cover an open region of space. And so this the vector field method has to be combined with also frequency methods. So really in multiple positions and analysis of, of, of that has to be combined. Uh, but for small a, it's possible to obtain these solutions by using the Carter tensor um, and to, to, to obtain this, this theorem in only in physical space. And this was done by Anderson group. Okay, so this, um, so the, the we can deal with the cost equation, you know, from the past few years, uh, we can deal with it. With, sorry, we can deal with the wave equation in care. Now, remember, we, we wanted to to. Um, to look at gravitational perturbations of care. So we need to, uh, we want to apply this vector field method to the Tukowski equation. Well, can we do that? Well, unfortunately not. Because when we want to do this integration by parts, let's say with the, DT, with the DDT, now here you see when, the, when we try to multiply by DDT, we want to do integration by parts, well, there's nothing we can do about these terms. These terms are going to be there, we don't know, don't know what to do with them. And on the other hand, uh, if we had a range of the equation, so if we only had box minus the potential equal to zero for a positive real potential, then actually if we can simply multiply by dt and integrate by parts. This would simply change the energy by adding the potential, a positive potential, which corresponds to that modif modifying the center and tensor, then we can adopt the same techniques. So here, does it this sound that well? Well, the Zabowski equation is more complicated, as you equation. We can deal with that well, then the Chanta second transformation here saves the day. Because in fact this was a crucial, a crucial component um, that was used in the proof of the Venus of the Schwarzschild, Belgian Jose Ronyaski, and in the uh, in analysis of the Tukowski question in care by Pan and Jose Ronyaski, so this was done in 2016, 2017, um, for um, to analyze the, the Tukowski question uh, in uh, in perturbations of, of Schwarzschild and care. You want to pass, you want to use the Chandra Sega transformation to pass from the cost equation to a regular equation that we can deal with. Now, uh, what is the Chandra Sega transformation in, uh, in, in care? How does, how does the regular equation look like? Well, remember, there is no magic, we cannot do magic perturbations of care directly. So, this is not going to be a full, real <laughs> regular equation. It's actually a generalized version of it. So, it's not fully decoupled, but it's sort of, kind of, uh, still fun in the couple. 
because it's a, it has a wedge with a part, but now also has additional first order term, which though it's, it's good because it comes with an I, the tip size, so when you try to do energy estimates, this term, so you, you multiply by dt times its conjugate, and get the real part of this term that actually vanishes. And now it's, it has some, no, some right hand side which depends on the curvature terms on the, on the alpha. So this should be thought as being really um, coupled with the defining equation for psi to the chanta set transformation. So you should really think of this regular equation coupled with the chanta set transformation can be solved as a system. And this is what, uh, what was done in, uh, in care for small a, but even for large a, uh, quite recently in a work of uh, Matisse de la Costa. And this, um, so this is the sort of, uh, it starts to unlock the, uh, the full linear perturbation of, of the care uh, solution for even for large A. And once you have the control for the Tukovsky variables, then you can use various methods uh, to then control all the other quantities which are more dependent on the gauge. And now, uh, so this kind of generalized regular equation I uh, just want to show you sort of briefly another application of this kind of, uh, of, this kind of um, equations. Uh, before that, so, let me, so this is about linear part. I also want to mention uh, that uh, the non-linear part of this equation, but I'll come back to that also uh, you know, really at the very end. Uh, but the reason why you know, the Einstein equation is expected to be stable also for the, its non-linear stability is that it satisfies what, what is called the null condition, the weak version of the null condition, which is that our right hand side, so remember in that example that the tip size square was really giving a uh, blow up of the solution, so that, would, that was bad. So basically, the null condition says that those kind of terms will not be there. But the, the, the terms that are right hand side are only terms which are quadratic in the first derivatives. Um, such that it's a quadratic form that is zero for all our vectors. So if you have a dt square, it's going to be coupled with minus ds square. So that it creates a null, a null um, form. And this was usually used in the Stabito Minkowski space in the 90s, where it's Bruch Heinemann, and also Stabito Schwarzschi um, in uh, the works by Heinemann Schuster and the Fermo Sorsi Minkowski table. Okay, so maybe I'm going to spend just a few. Um, Minus just to sort of um, see how this kind of generalized attributor equation can be used for something that uh, was not that cannot be done to mod stability. Because you know, remember I told you that the term Newman black hole was not proved to be, I mean the mod stability was not proven. And um, if, in fact, if we go to the gauge under Sega's book, to the part so, uh, the dedicated to the term which is something like four pages or so. Uh, he writes the methods that proved to be so successful in treating gravitational perturbations of care do not seem to be applicable for treating the couple of electron and the gravitational perturbations of Kernion. The principal obstacle is in finding separate equations. Here is a if you consider the origin is apparent in the solubility of the couple between spin 1 and spin 2 fields. So, what, what, is, what is the problem in Kernion? Well, Kernion is a solution of the Einstein Maxwell equation. So, here the, the, the gravitational radiation which is very is coupled. To the electromagnetic radiation. And as we know from, let's say, from, from the Tukovsky equation, the gravitational radiation is something that's uh, transported by the spin plus and minus two functions, and the electromagnetic radiation is supported by spin plus and minus one functions. So he, since here now are coupled together, we expect to have some sort of um, coupled system where the Tukovsky equation for spin two, our gravitational radiation is sourced by uh, electromagnetic radiation and vice versa. There were these are kind of operators that raise and lower the spin as needed. Right, and this is sort of what happens, even though no, these quantities are not exact, I mean, you need to find some gauge variant on, on versions of them. And now, what people were doing back then, what Chandra Seca was, was doing really, is to the multi-composition of, of this coupled system. And remember, when you do model decomposition, you get this angular limit that satisfies, that, that defines spheroidal harmonics. This reduces to spherical harmonics, so A equal to zero. But in general, are much worse beasts, the spheroidal harmonics. And in fact, if you, um, if you look at 
um, spare galvanics, if you change if you change the spin, if you raise or lower the spin of spare galvanics, you get precisely they they're very nicely related between them. So if you uh, raise the spin of a spherical harmonic or spin 1, you get something that's proportional to a spherical harmonic or spin 2. But nothing like that is true for a spheroidal harmonics. And so that's why uh, this kind of uh, system was not able, uh, was not severable, in fact, uh, in, in the modern analysis. And that's what, that's what, what uh, Chandra Zegar writes at the end of this small uh, chapter. His whole effort to decouple these equations were not successful. It's really this dependence uh, of ability of carbon to spin one and spin two field. They are related because of the Einstein Maxwell equation, so because of the charge, but they are, um, and, and because it's a rotating black hole, it's a spheroidal harmonics, uh, and so they cannot be, uh, this system cannot be separated from spheroidal, spheroidal harmonics. So what this really means is that the mode decomposition that was done back then very rightly to simplify the equations, well in this case was making them unsolvable. So the, uh, the solution to that is to perform a physical space analysis for this. And in fact, what I, what I found is that the Chandra Sekar, there is a Chandra Sekar transformation also in the Kermion case. So now you have this uh, sort of generalized energy wheeler that also has the coupling to these operators. And now uh, this admits a combined energy momentum tensor. So if you sum the energy momentum of the two uh, of the two energy uh, equations, you actually get some like some cancellation on the on the on this coupling uh, that allows to get energy estimates for this for this system. So in particular, this is a physical space analysis that in particular improves the absence of expansion going modes. You know, in general, uh, of course, it makes my tradition very happy. Um, to know, the, you know her proof of some stability, the linear stability of the charge taking the calls, the most general one is necessary to um, get around the failure of the mode analysis. Okay, so this is just an application of the, the, uh, this generalized Jupiter equation. And so that as an aside, uh, going into the non-linear stability, um, um, I'm going to uh, so I want to mention like, this, this work with Big Bill and that uh, we have done to sort of bridge really the gap from sort of the physics, um, uh, sort of uh, the, 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 the analysis, the analysis uh, done in cases through sort of uh, mode analysis to, in, into the second order uh, perturbations. So in the non-linear, so into the non-linear stability. So if you really consider second order um, perturbations of our care, so if you sort of uh, expand up to epsilon squared, what can be uh, found is that our the linear part of, your, of the Riemann curvature satisfies the, the, the cost equation, as we've been said, but also the second order satisfies the cost equation, where now it's sourced by all the first order quantities. So that's what, that's what makes necessary to study the second order perturbation, the reconstruction of the magic. And we found a way to reconstruct it by using a certain gauge, that we addition gauge. Um, and this, uh, in this gauge, we actually show that, uh, remember that system, that, that entangled system of uh, all these you know, 40 quantities can actually be reduced to something like I mean, six equations that can be solved hierarchically. So you can start with the cost equation, you solve it numerically, and you find your psi 4. And now you realize that in this gauge, your psi 4 is the only thing that appears on the right hand side of a transport equation for a real cheap coefficient for a resolving symbol. So you can solve for this, let's say, this gamma. And then you realize that this gamma is the only thing that appears on the right hand side of another equation for another metric component. And you go on for like six equations, and this allows you to find, to find this, you know, uh, six quantities or so that then uh, unlock all the other quantities uh, using all the other equations. And so this reconstructs the metric, and once you have reconstructed all the first order metric, you can plug in those uh, first order metric into the source, into the right hand side of your second order deposit equation. Okay, so with this, I am going to um, get it to, to till the end the conclusion of my talk by simply giving a very um, 
bird's view overview of this work with the, uh, not only necessarily the slow taking care. So this theorem that I mentioned at the beginning, that the care family is an only unstable solution to the nested vacuum equation. So as I mentioned, this proof is, is, is obtained as a combination of results. It's also a construction of gauge, modulation of parameters, and there's estimates for the gauge selected quantities and estimates for the gauge valid quantities. And you know, this is for a total of more than 2,000 pages. Um, so unfortunately, these kind of problems are normally uh, not solved in very, very long papers. Um, and so um, there's no way I can give you um, really, uh, you know, a sense of 2,000 pages. Uh, really, I'm mostly going to uh, spend my last few minutes on uh, this picture. Um, that uh, hopefully you know, is more adjustable than uh, <laughs> 2,000 pages. Um, and so what is this picture about? So this picture is, uh, is, is trying to, it's trying to explain how these kind of problems are solved. How do we, how do we even uh, prove, uh, how can we prove the non-linear stability? So the, the non-linear stability result is really about um, getting perturbations of some known, um, of some known uh, black holes and show that this perturbation actually exists forever and you see after a long time they, they will have a complete time infinity and also the horizon have you know have all the other properties that the black hole the, the, the cat black hole has. So how do we even go, how do we construct this global solution? Well this is done by what the mathematicians call the continuity argument. In a certain sense you should think of it as being uh, you construct the, your your um, your infinite, your final space time, that is, you know, here it's about the very spread lines, to a, a limiting sequence of finite space times. And the finite space, space of space time is this one, is the, 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 the one with the boundary in black here. Okay, so the continuity argument really relies on the following uh, trivial fact that if you, you know, a subset of an interval which is non empty, open, and closed, it's the full. Uh, it's the full interval. Okay, and the, so in the interval you should have in mind is really, let's say, from some time zero to infinity. And um, what you're going to apply this, this, this uh, fact is, uh, is the set where you know, all, the, uh, all the times for which if, uh, if this finite space time is bounded above by some finite time, Let's say this, this one appears on time t, um, and um, in the region, so in this finite region, you have some what are called bootstrap assumptions and gauge assumptions. So if you have these two things, some bootstrap and gauge assumption, assumptions, then um, so this is going to be your finite, your finite uh, region has these two properties. Then you, you, you want to show that well, well the times for the works this happen is actually in an empty, open, and closed region of, uh, so it's a subset of zero infinity, so in fact it is the whole, the whole region from zero to infinity, so it is actually a global solution. So, and how, so first of all, I'm going to be just, uh, since you know, uh, maybe, maybe many of you are not native speaker uh, in English, like I am, I'm not. <laughs> And you know the word bootstrap has always been uh, very confusing to me, um, and I only very recently looked it up in the dictionary. And in fact, you know, bootstrap really means self, um, uh, sort of a self-realizing, the self-sustaining. So you can say, the, so it is used <laughs> in, in English. Some in some. Uh, in some context, I don't know, I've never heard anyone who's not a mathematician using this word, but, um, uh, but you know, <laughs> my English is not that good. So, um, in any case, so what, 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 does this, what does it mean that you have bootstrap assumptions? Well, it means that now you have assumptions on, uh, on something, so in particular on the smallness, uh, on the smallness of, of uh, some norms, and in particular on the closeness of your space time, so the space time in this finite region, your closeness to the care solution you started with. Okay, so you, you're assuming that your, so the, the, the metric, for example, in this region is epsilon close, so it's very close to your original uh, perturbation. 
And with this, it is actually very quantitative, so and it's not just uh, very close. I mean, close with a certain decay rates and so on and so forth. So you assume this long list of assumptions, which is uh, which are bootstrap assumptions. And the reason why they're good bootstrap assumptions is because you have them, so you you're, you're assuming them, you can use them. But then the main difficulty in the proof here, in proving that this subset. Of, of your interval is not empty, open, and closed, the main difficulty is to prove that it's, uh, it's open. And the way to prove that it's open is to show that this bootstrap assumption can actually be improved. So if you have that everything like your norm was less equal than epsilon, where you actually want to do your machinery, your mathematical machinery, to show that this norm can be improved to be, let's say, less equal than one half epsilon. Then, if you can improve this bootstrap assumption, so you can improve the assumption that you started with by this thing by epsilon, by, by one half, then it means that by continuity, so that's why it's a continuity argument, you can still extend your space time a little bit further from this, from this um, final time um, to be still, to still have the same norms bounded by epsilon, because you improved it to one half. So you, you still have a little bit of room to go on and still be bounded by the same epsilon. And this is uh, this is proving the openness of your of your interval. So really the crucial point is improving the construct um, assumptions and this is done through the choice of gauge. And in all this in most of these works, gauge is chosen in the final time up here. So in this let's say this sphere has star this final hypersurface sigma star, it's just you should think of it as being the final time. Like your bootstrap, your gauge assumptions are imposed down here and are used to improve your bootstrap assumptions. So that's, uh, so this is, uh, I hope this gives you sort of the sense of how uh, human, you know, the, how what is the setup of the proof and really that the main step is to improve the bootstrap assumptions. And that's where all I've seen so far, I mean, is analysis of the cost equation, of the Lady Wheeler equation, plays an crucial role. That it, this is used to improve the Gusser assumptions. You start by the Wheeler cost equation, the generalized Lady Wheeler equation, to start unlocking, uh, start improving the norms for the Tukowski variables. And then you use uh, your gauge assumptions to improve all the Gusser assumptions, also for all the other. So this is a system, so this hierarchy, like in the, the work I showed um, before in, uh, with, with uh, uh, Praetorius and uh, etc. Um, we, uh, this, um, this kind of uh, idea is, is used to really use the, the gauge conditions to improve the bootstrap assumptions. And of course, you know, there are lots, lots of details such as how do you how do you set up, do you find you know, the, the parameter, the, the final parameters of your, of your care family? Well, that is, that is done through some identification of the parameters. Again, here, the final speed and the final time. So that as this, this final time goes to infinity, you pick up exactly what is the final mass and the final angular momentum of the black hole. And so on, and there are uh, many, uh, many some of these, as you can imagine, in you know, you know, 2,000 pages. Uh, but you know, this is really not really just to give a, a sense of um, a sense of how these kind of proofs are uh, are done. And uh, you know, with this, I want to thank you for your attention and, and hear. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, fine. Okay. So thanks a lot for a nice presentation, and it's a pity that you are not with us here. However, we try to ask some questions if you don't mind. So we do have a question. Uh, Maybe you should talk first. Yes. So, uh, 
that the question what are the assumptions on the regularity condition of scry? Yeah, I mean, are there is, uh, or, or maybe okay, okay differently. What conditions are satisfied by the perturbations on scry? By the idea here, sorry. Uh, I'm asking about the scry, okay, and about the perturbed scry by, by the perturbation. So, what are properties of the perturbed scry? Okay, so first of all, okay, the, the way the way this is done, it's not through perturbing a scry, right? So, you, the scry is obtained as a, as a final, as a limiting. As a limiting segment of, of basically this of this uh, sigma star, the sigma star in the limit, the sigma star will converge to scry. So we're not really thinking of perturbing scry. I mean, what what you can do, you know, you don't have any assumption for scry. Scry is not there in fact at the beginning of your your, your initial data. In your initial data is just on a three-dimensional space like other surface. What you can ask yourself is that what are the properties of scry uh, after you know, after the limiting sequence has been produced and after it. So then, okay, you can prove um, you can prove the scry is, is complete, and um, and I um, I, I so now the regularity of scry. I'm not I'm not entirely sure right now in what is the precisely the what would be I mean, as a as a consequence of the of the limiting sequence. I I believe that if the scry is smooth, then there are some peeling properties that would necessarily hold. Um, and I, I think in here um, not, they, they, they do not hold uh, all of them with with the with the sort of the ones that we really, with the specific decay that would be um, implied by by the smoothness of of scry. So it, I am not sure if it's smooth. So yeah, so I'm, I'm not super confident now what would be the regularity uh, because this is sort of this is in the part. Um, so the, the part where it's, uh, it's the, the the recovering of the gauge dependent quantities um, by the Arnold Schuster. So I, 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 I'm not sure if they recovered a, a specific regularity uh, plus for us by plus. Um, so but does it answer your question? So that there is no perturbation of scribe to start with. I mean, you, you simply obtain it as a an emitting sequence of of your perturbed initial data. Yes, thank, thank you. And the second, the second question, if, if I can. Uh, so, uh, does it matter for you whether uh, this, the black hole is extremal or not? Does anything special happen for extremal black holes? Yes, yeah, so it does matter a lot. So, in particular, you see this theorem is, is true for uh, any much smaller than that, so definitely not extremal. Um, so, a Many of the of the things that that I said, right, so are expected to be true, for sure, especially you know because of this work that I mentioned here, right? They're expected to be true. The of the cost equation, so on. They're expected to be true. The full sub extremal range, but you know again, weight on extremality, uh, because in a, in the extremal case there are some instability that uh, kicks in. Uh, so there is this, there are some conservation laws that mean that there is there are some quantities that are conserved and some some quantities that are the blow up along the event horizon. Um, so that's um, so that's sort of um, the difference. So in, even the theorem itself is not expected to be true as it is. I mean, the, the, that if some stability results are true in that case, you have to be modulated against you know some some of these instabilities that um, that take place on the event horizon. Um, but even that, I mean, uh, even doing the nonlinear stability for in, in the A less than M, it's still uh, highly non-trivial because in the way we do it here, so the way we use this analysis of the Tukowski equation here, as it's written here, I can say, I mean, we use this physical space method by Anderson Blue that I mentioned at the point in the talk that only goes for very small A um, because um, it, 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 is a, it is a way of not using the mode decomposition and uh, which um, which really makes use of the fact that for very small a, the traffic region is very close to 3M and the algorithm is very close to the event horizon. 
And if you start going into the full selection range, then the tracking region becomes larger and larger. In fact, it touches all the way to the event horizon. And the elbow region uh, gets larger and larger. And again, not only it touches the, it goes all the way. I mean, it, go, it goes really, they, they overlap. I mean, it's the elbow region and the the other region and the traffic region overlap. So in that case, I mean, there are these uh, model composition methods that have used, for example, these linear words. But in the non-linear words, in the non-linear picture, it's not. I mean, it have not been. I mean, mod, uh, these frequency um, frequency methods have not been used really at this moment in any non-linear problems, but it doesn't mean that it cannot be done. I, mean, I think there are some uh, you know, suggestions uh, and some you know, um, sort of program on how to use them, uh, but it's just less obvious how to do them because the, the kind of vector field method that I described um, before, so this is what I mean by physical space method, it's very something that it's clear, it can be clearly applied to really basically any any space time that satisfies, you know, for example, the Einstein equation. Uh, well, if you do Fourier methods, you're really relying on the symmetry history so of taking uh, your, your, Fourier, your Fourier transform with respect to the D, with respect to the fine. So you're using the symmetries. So if you if you're in a non-linear picture, you don't have the symmetries anymore, but the symmetries are in the background. Um, and so you, it's not that clear how you define the Fourier, how you would, how you would, you would use them. So, so again, I'm not saying that it's not possible, and maybe some people uh, have any how to do it, but it's uh, not that clear, it's not that obvious, and so it is very much not extreme, it is not even in the sub-extreme range, so this, this theorem is really for very small k, at least you know, for now, that's what it is. Yes, Basically, the way we control the A, 
So this is part of this, this part here, the construction of gauge relation parameters. Um, so the A is measured uh, in, uh, by, in this, this final rate of the, the construction of this final spacetime. That is, uh, in this final region, in this final sphere, has star. So there is a definition of, of angular momentum, and then that's related, I can tell you now, again, it's quite technical, but it's related to the curve of the beta. Also, the, the, I mean, this is a curvature component, then in human Newman Perros uh, formula, it would correspond to the capital Psi uh, 1. So it's not the, the Tukowski variable, it's the variable next to it. Is the second, the other, the second, the other variable that vanishes. Um, so if you can control as yes, to the L equal one mode uh, of this uh, quantity, so the curve of this of this curvature component is what is used to identify identify the angular momentum. So that that gives you a three dimensional back. So that's that's a three dimensional vector. Um, as it's it's an L equal one mode. So you have you have the projection of the three. Um, spherical conics basically, and so you don't. There is no preference in the z direction or anything else. You just measure your the the way the angular momentum has changed from the initial data up to up to you get here through this uh, curve of beta and through this curvature component, and you show as part of the proof that this quantity remains small. So all the three directions remain small. Okay. Let us make this picture again.